afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the latest installment of the Option Industry Council's webinar series. My name is Mark Benziquin, and I'm a staff member here at the OIC. We're glad that you can join us to learn more about options as a flexible and powerful trading tool. In our presentation today, Income with Portfolio Overwriting, we'll learn a new way to use covered calls for long-term income generation. And as always, we'll cover the material and your questions in a quick 60-minute session. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our presenter today, Mr. Alan Elman. Alan is the epitome of a self-starter, getting involved with investing after being licensed in dentistry, personal training, and real estate. He's the president of the Blue Collar Investor Group and author of over 200 articles and five books on income and investing. And with him is Barry Bergman, Director of Research for the Blue Collar Investor and who oversees the publication of their watch list. We here at the OIC are very happy and lucky to have them both with us today. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few disclaimer items. Please note that uh, options involve risks and are not suitable for everyone. As a matter of fact, an individual should not enter into option transactions until they have read and understood the disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. You can get a copy of it here at the OIC or through your broker. Also, as Alan will tell you, uh, for the sake of simplicity, we are uh, going to be uh, talking about uh, some different uh, strategies that will not take into consideration commissions, transaction fees, and other tax considerations, or even margin requirements. Uh, also, please note that the strategies and suggestions presented during this discussion are the ideas of the presenter alone and not of the Options Industry Council. That being said, I know that Alan has a lot of material for us to get to today, so let's get right to it. Alan? Okay, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate it, and I appreciate the very large audience that's attending this webinar today. The topic is portfolio overwriting, and basically what that talks about is how to use the covered call writing strategy against long-term buy-and-hold portfolios. So the hypothetical is, is that we own stocks over the long term, probably at a very low cost basis, and we'd like to generate additional income via that portfolio, and yet at the same time, we don't want those shares sold as a result of our option obligation. So stated differently, we want our cake and eat it too. So in today's presentation, we're going to discuss and focus like a laser on the techniques that we could use to accomplish those two missions. One, generate additional cash, leveraging our long-term buy and hold securities, and at the same time, minimizing the risk of having those shares taken away from us. Now, uh, we're gonna first start with uh, an overview of covered call writing. So part one of the webinar will be a review of covered call writing. I know many of you are familiar with this strategy and probably a large uh, percentage are also just beginning the covered call writing strategy. So we're going to do uh, an overview of covered call writing in part one, and then in part two, we're going to focus in on portfolio overwriting specifically. Now, in this preview example, we're going to purchase 100 shares of stock, we'll call it company XYZ, at a cost of $48 per share. So our cost basis then is $4,800. That represents our investment. Now, the reason I say 100 shares is because for every one options contract that we sell, we must first own 100 shares of the underlying security, be it a stock or an exchange-traded fund. Now, once we own these shares and we're in a covered or protected position, we are now free to sell the option. So buy the stock first and then sell the option. Now, many of your broker platforms will have buy right combination forms where you can execute these trades in one trade, but uh, frequently, while we're using these strategies, we're going to be using either one leg or another. So the best way to learn this is via legging in in two separate trades. In this hypothetical, we're going to agree to sell our shares for $50 at any time over the next one month. So my sweet spot are one-month options. There are options that exist for shorter time frames and for longer time frames, but one month options is where I've had the bulk of my success and I've been using this strategy now for over two decades. Now in return for undertaking this obligation, we are paid a cash premium. 
A typical premium would be $1.50 per share, but if the underlying security is less volatile, the premium will be lower, and if the underlying security is more volatile, the premium could be higher. But we're going to say $1.50 or $150. Now, as Mark mentioned before, we're not going to be including uh, commissions. Uh, if you're going to be using this strategy, you're going to be making a lot of trades, and you should be using an online discount broker. And those commissions, as many of you know, are getting lower and lower and lower. You should be able to execute these trades for under $10 per trade, in many cases even much lower than that. So the percentages you see on my slides will not be impacted greatly by the broker commissions. Now, the initial return for $150 on a cost basis of $4,800 is a 3.1%. Again, it's a one-month trade, which annualizes out to 37% if you could do that every month. Now, at the end of the contract month, there were two possible major outcomes. In the first scenario, let's assume for a moment that the price of the stock never supersedes the agreed-upon $50 sale price. Let's say it stays stagnant at 48 well, the option buyer is not going to exercise those shares and buy our shares from us at 50 if they could be purchased at market at a lower price. So the option expires worthless. We keep the $150. We still own the underlying shares, and now we're free to sell an option the following month. So we then have a resulting return of 3.1% for the one month on the option side. Now, the second possible major outcome is that the price of the stock does, in fact, go higher than the $50 agreed-upon sales price. Let's say it pops to 52 Well, the option buyer is going to exercise that option, buy our shares from us at 50 then they could turn around, sell it at market at 52 and generate a profit. But we are the option seller, so let's have a look at this trade now through our eyes. We generated an initial return of $150 on the sale of the option. That's ours to keep no matter what. Now we've generated an additional $200 on the sale of the stock. Buy at 48, sell at 50 times 100. That results in a total profit of $350 on a cost basis of $4,800. That re represents a 7.3% one month return. And that annualizes out to that ridiculous number you see at the bottom of the screenshot, 87%. So let me stop now and state the obvious, something that you already know. You're not going to get this kind of return on every position in your portfolio every month of the year. However, in normal and bull market environments, you are going to see a few of these. So uh, it's important to know how and when to use this particular type of strike, which is known as the out-of-the-money strike. Now, uh, before we go on, we have to cover a few definitions. If you're going to use this strategy, you have to be able to talk the talk. There aren't a lot, so let's cover the few of them, and then you'll hear me repeat them a few more times as we go through the webinar today. Let's start off with the very, very basics. What is an option? Well, an option is a contract that gives the holder or buyer of that contract the right but not the obligation to buy or sell 100 shares of stock at a fixed price known as the strike price, and it was $50 in our preview example, by a specific date known as the expiration date, and it was a one-month option we used in the preview example. Most monthly options expire on the third Friday of the month, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, a call option, if we purchase the call option, gives us the right to buy 100 shares at a specific price, once again known as the strike price. A put option, which we're not dealing with in today's presentation, gives the holder or buyer of that option the right to sell 100 shares at the strike price by the expiration date. Next, we're going to look at the option strike price as it relates to the price of the stock. We have three definitions here. The first, at the money. At the money is where the strike price, or the price that we agree to sell our shares for, is the same as the market value of the stock. So we buy a stock for 50 and agree to sell it for 50. That strike is known as at the money. And yes, folks, we actually get paid for that. 
Number two is the one that I want you to focus in on because the in the money strike is so rarely used by covered call writers. That's where the strike price or the price we agree to sell our shares for is lower than the current market value of the stock. Let me give you an example and then we'll embellish it a little bit in the next slide. We buy a stock for 56 and agree to sell it for 50. Now, for most beginners, they would say, well, why the heck would we do that? The answer is the premium that we're going to generate from the sale of that in-the-money strike is going to compensate us for the $6 we're going to lose on the sale of the stock plus a little bit more. And that little bit more represents our actual initial profit. So when you sell an in-the-money strike and you're trying to figure out what your profit is, you have to do a little math. But uh, I've developed a calculator that will actually do this math for you and in just a few moments, I'll tell you how you can all get a free copy of that calculator. So don't worry about the math. The third definition of the option strike as it relates to the stock price is the out-of-the-money strike. That's the one that I, I use for the preview example, and it is by far the most popular of the strike prices used by covered call writers. Probably in the high 90% of covered call writers use only out of the money strikes. And of course, uh, that's the one that you want to use if it's appropriate uh, because you have an opportunity for two income streams in the same month with the same investment, one from the sale of the option and the other from share appreciation from current market value up to the strike price. In the preview example, we bought the shares at 48 and agreed to sell them for 50. So we made the $150 on the option side and we made $200 on the stock side. So in, in neutral to bull markets, we want to usually favor out of the money strikes. But as you'll see when we get into the calculations, that if it's a bearish or volatile market, the in the money strike could be the way to go. I have two more definitions here for you. And if you look at the equation at the bottom of the screenshot, uh, everybody who sells options should know this equation. And that is that the premium that we generate consists of intrinsic value plus time value. Now, intrinsic value only applies to the in-the-money strike. So if we sell an at-the-money strike, buy a stock at 50 and agree to sell it at 50, or an out-of-the-money strike, buy a stock at 48 and agree to sell it for 50, the premium is 100% time value. But if we sell an in-the-money strike, buy a stock at 56 and agree to sell it for 50, and we receive a premium of $8, that $8 has two components to it. The, fo the first component is the intrinsic value or the amount that the $50 strike is in the money or lower than current market value. So the intrinsic value is 6 We must deduct that $6 from the $8 to get us our true initial time value profit, which is $2, 8 minus 6 The calculator will do that for you. So... Intrinsic value applies only to in-the-money strikes. Everything above intrinsic value is time value, and at-the-money and out-of-the-money strikes are 100% time value. So, to summarize, when we sell covered calls, we buy stocks and sell options on a share-for-share -share basis. So if you want to sell one covered call contract, you must first own 100 shares. Five contracts, you must first own 500 shares. So if we're purchasing shares for the purpose of covered call writing, we always purchase them in 100 share increments. Now, of course, the most important thing is how much cash can we generate by selling these options? How do we know, how can we figure out how much money we could make leveraging our shares to generate income? Well, we must access what's known as an options chain. And an options chain is simply a list of options prices for a particular security. Now, whatever broker you're using is going to have this information, uh, but there are also some free sites that offer this information, like finance.yahoo. And what you do is just simply put in the ticker symbol of the stock, and that'll take you to another page where you look for the options link. Now, here is an options chain. They almost all have the same information in them, but some of them are formatted a bit differently. So let me just orient you on this particular options chain for ExxonMobil, which at the time was trading at 93.82. dollars 
And if you look at the far right column, the strike price, those are the strikes that we can select to sell our option. Now, if we look at the out-of-the-money 95 call, which I have highlighted in yellow, and we move over to the center of the screenshot, we see that the bid column is $1.26. You notice in the middle you see a bid and an ask column. We sell at the bid, the lower, and we buy at the ask, the higher, and the difference goes to the market maker. Now, in this particular case, the bid-ask spread is only a penny. It's very, very tight. So there's not much negotiating we could do. But if we had a wider bid-ask spread frequently, we could leverage what's known as the show of fill rule and uh, get a better price than the published bid. But in my slides today, what I'm going to do is show you the published bid. We're going to work off that worst-case scenario. So in a case like this where stock is trading at 93.82 and we sell the out-of-the-money 95 call for $1.26, our initial one-month return is going to be about 1.3% this particular case here. Now, I've just put this slide in to remind you that when we're figuring out our initial profit, we're fa factoring in time value only divided by our cost basis. So if we sell an in-the-money strike, we must deduct the intrinsic value. I want to re I'm repeating that because so many covered call writers accidentally exaggerate the returns they're getting because they forget to deduct the intrinsic value of the premium. Now, before we show you the, the spreadsheet of the Elman calculator and how that works, uh, let's have a look at another options chain. This one for Synaptics, the ticker symbol is SYNA. And at the time I made this screenshot, it was trading at 57.36. So I highlighted in yellow the 55 in the money call, lower than current market value, and the $60 out-of-the-money call, higher than current market value. Now, if you look all the way over to the right-hand column, I circled in red uh, open interest. Uh, that shows you the liquidity of the option. And uh, you, you don't want to sell an option or even buy an option that has almost no open interest. So one of the guidelines I use is I want to see a minimum of 100 contracts of open interest and or a bid ask spread of 30 cents or less. So you want to see some kind of liquidity. Now in this particular case, if we go by the published bid, you'll notice the 55 call had a bid price of $4.90. And the $60 out of the money call had a published bid price of $2.40. The spread is $4.90 to $5.10 or a 20 cent spread uh, for the 55 and $2.40 to $2.55 or a 15 cent spread for the $60 out of the money call. There's a possibility that we could have negotiated a better price, but we're going to use the published bid price. Now here's the, the spreadsheet of part of it from the multiple tab of the Elman calculator. And what you do is you feed in the information you receive from the options chain into the blue cells on the left, and then the white cells become populated. So let's first uh, focus in on the $50, $55 in the money call. You see the price of the security was $57.32. Remember the two bid prices were $4.90 and $2.40, and the strike prices were $55 and $60. So we're going to focus in first on the $55 in the money strike. Now remember I told you that we must deduct the, the intrinsic value to get our real initial time value return. Well, in the white cells, you see that the intrinsic value is 232. That's the difference between 5732 and the 55 strike. So the calculator will deduct the 232 from the 490, and the result of the return on the option or the RU is 4.7%. That's not an exaggerated figure. That's the actual initial time value return based on deducting the intrinsic value from the total premium. Now, upside potential. What if Synaptics moves higher in price? It moves from 57.32 to 65. Well, too bad, folks, because we are limited. We are agreeing to sell the shares for 55. So there is no upside potential in a case like this. However, and this is very important, we have downside protection of the option profit of the 4.7% of 4.0%. Stated differently, we are guaranteed a 4.7% one-month return as long as share value does not decline 
by more than 4% by expiration Friday. Bill stated differently, we guarantee that 4.7% return as long as Synaptics does not decline from 57.32 to below the 55 strike. This is the strike I would favor in a, in a bear market environment or in a volatile market environment, pre-Brexit, pre-election, things like that, pre-Fed watch. So you favor the in-the-money strike where you have this downside protection of the time value profit. That is not the same thing as the break-even. The break-even is the stock price minus the entire premium. So when I talk about downside protection, I'm talking of protection of the initial time value profit. Now, let's say it's a, a bullish market environment. Chart technicals are bullish and confirming. We're feeling pretty good about the overall market and the stock in general. Well, then we would favor the out-of-the-money strike, in this case, the $60 call, which generated $240. Since it's not in the money, it's all-time value. That represents a 4.2% initial one-month return. Now, what about upside potential? Well, this is a big deal now because we have an opportunity for share value to increase from 57.32 up to the 60 strike. That's an upside of 268, which represents an additional 4.7%. We have an opportunity, in this case, for an 8.9% one-month return. What about downside protection of the option profit? Zero. Downside protection will only have an effect if you sell an in-the-money strike where intrinsic value protects time value. Once again, there's always a break-even, and that break-even is the price of the stock, 57.32, minus the entire premium, in this case, 240. To get a free copy of this calculator, by the way, if you go to my website and click on the free resources link on the top black bar of all my web pages, you can download the calculator to your device. Now, I want to show you a strategy I use in my mother's portfolio, also covered call writing, but I use exchange-traded funds. Now, exchange-traded funds are mutual funds that behave like stocks, and many of them have options associated with them. This particular screenshot, I'm showing you the Qs, which represent 100 of the largest non-financial companies that trade on the NASDAQ exchange. You know, basically, we're talking about tech companies here. At the time I made this screenshot, the Qs were trading at 88.73. We're going to have a look at the 89 strike. You could see highlighted in pink. And uh, you could see the open interest all the way to the right-hand column was 32,000 contracts of open interest, a hugely popular option. And if we look at the bid column, we see the bid column generated at $1.16. So let's feed that into the uh, spreadsheet, the Elman calculator. And we see that the, uh, it's an out-of-the-money, slightly out-of-the-money strike, uh, so it's all-time value. And that generated a 1.3% uh, one-month initial return with a possibility of another 0.3% if the Qs move from 88.73 up to the 89 strike. So uh, we have a possibility here of a 1.6% one-month return, which would annualize out to over 19%. You know, generally speaking, um, ETFs, exchange-traded funds, uh, have less volatility than individual stocks, so the premiums will be lower. So it's a more conservative way of using covered call writing, and that's why I use that in my mom's account. And uh, for my own accounts, I use only individual stocks. So depending on your trading style, what your goals are, you can make your selection based on that. Now, let me just also say that some ETFs are very, very volatile. So there are exceptions to this rule. But generally speaking, individual stocks have more implied volatility than do exchange-traded funds. Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about a very, very important topic here, and that's strike price selection. What option are we going to choose? So we have uh, the three types of, of uh, options that we mentioned before, the moneyness of the option. The in the money, the example we gave was buy a stock at 56 and agree to sell it for 50. This is the most conservative approach to covered call writing because we have that insurance policy in the form of intrinsic value, which, by the way, is the only insurance policy we'll ever have that we don't have to pay for. That's paid for by the option buyer in the form of intrinsic value. And we should use these when chart technicals are mixed and the market is bearish or volatile. 
So it gives us that additional downside protection. The at the money strike, the example we gave was buy a stock at 50 and agree to sell it for 50. That's a more bullish approach to covered call writing. It'll give you your highest initial returns, but no opportunity for share appreciation and no downside protection of the initial profit. There's always a break even. And finally, the out of the money strike, which is the one that's used almost all the time by most covered call writers, and that's the one that um, you feel bullish about the market. You can even use it, though, in neutral market conditions. And uh, that's the one where you have the opportunity to generate two income streams in the same month with the same cash investment, one from the sale of the option and the other from share appreciation from current market value up to the out of the money strike price. So one size does not fit all when you're selecting which strike price to use. And if you're selling monthly options, you could craft that and change that to current market conditions every single month. Okay, so part two of the webinar presentation now is where we're going to focus specifically on portfolio overriding. We have a long-term buy and hold portfolio. Many of our securities are of a very low cost basis. We're generating maybe 6 to 8% a year. We'd like to increase that by another 6%. So we want an additional 6% per year in this particular strategy. I'm using that as a hypothetical. You could set you know, your goal to whatever number you want, but here we want to do it modestly because these are long-term buy and hold stocks that we do not want to sell because selling them may result in some negative tax consequences. So we're also making the assumption that we're not trading in a sheltered account. Now, if our goal annually is 6%, that breaks down to a half a percent per month. If you just think back to some of the returns that we showed you before on these real-life options chains, you'll realize that that's kind of a small amount compared to what we were talking about before if we were doing traditional covered call writing. We're only going to use out-of-the-money strikes because we want our shares to continue to appreciate. We don't want to cap them since we're hanging on to these shares, and we'd like this income to be additional income over and above what we've been receiving up to this point. So with, with portfolio overriding, we're specifically going to use only out-of-the-money strikes. Again, the example we gave was you buy a stock at 48 and agree to sell it for 50, so the strike price is higher than current market value. And our premium goal in this hypothetical is a half a percent a month. Let's talk about the pros and cons because um, there are advantages and disadvantages to every strategy, and you're here today because you're seeking to get higher than risk-free returns. If you were happy with treasuries, you wouldn't be here today. So let's talk about some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages because every single strategy has its pros and cons. All right, so with the advantages, we're generating a constant monthly cash flow. Ladies and gentlemen, when you click your computer to execute the option sale trade, that cash is in your account seconds later and available to use either that day or the next trading day. We also get downside protection in bear markets. What if the market is going down and we generated a half a percent that month selling options? Well, we now have a half a percent more than we would have had had we not sold the options. Another advantage of covered call writing in general is that retail investors are granted this level of trading approval uh, pretty easily. It's considered uh, by most brokerages the lowest level of options trading approval. And the reason for that is considered low risk. Notice I didn't say no risk. And also intuitive for most retail investors. So uh, another thing with covered call writing is most brokers, pretty much all brokers across the board, will allow us to use it in self-directed IRA accounts for the reasons I just alluded to. And we could use this as an additional monthly source of income. I've been using covered call writing now since the 1990s, and initially I needed it to help fund my son's college and professional school educations. Uh, I used it to purchase my first real estate property. Uh, but now that uh, the boys are off the um, payroll, I could take that money now and just reinvest it and compound my money, the eighth wonder of the world. Now, I would be very remiss if I did not include this screenshot. 
there are disadvantages to every strategy that is trying to generate higher than risk-free returns. So what are the disadvantages of covered call writing, portfolio writing in particular? Well, early exercise can result in tax consequences, and that's what we're going to focus in on, on how to minimize those possibilities. Never be 100%. We could never say we're 100% guaranteed that our shares won't be sold, but we can actually take it down to a minuscule percentage where it happens so rarely that it's almost not worth mentioning. But I want you to know that that possibility does exist. Of course, the general disadvantage of covered call writing is that share appreciation is limited by the strike price. And that's the reason why we are going to only use out-of-the-money strikes for our portfolio overriding strategy. Now, the last two bullets uh, actually apply to all option strategies, probably all investment strategies. And that is, there's a learning curve and a modest time commitment. Now, um, the learning curve for most retail investors starting out is going to be at least three to four months of education and paper trading or practice trading. And um, the time commitment depends on how many securities you're using. But I will tell you this, if you're using shares that you already own and stock selection is not part of the equation, you're not going to be spending a real lot of time every month on this strategy. Uh, let me just give you a feel for what it's like for me. Um, I have between 15 and 25 different stock positions in my covered call writing portfolios and sell between 50 and 100 contracts every month. That time takes me between three and five hours a month. And I have to tell you that I get paid way more than a half a day's pay. So once you master the three required skills for covered call writing, and that is stock selection, option selection, and position management. As intimidating as it might be initially when you're just learning it, it'll become very intuitive and not very time consuming once you've mastered the technique. Okay, remember now we don't want our shares sold. So what if the price of the stock is higher than the strike price by expiration Friday, even by one penny? Well, if we take no action, our shares will be sold on the Saturday after expiration Friday. You'll go into your brokerage account, you'll take a look and say, what happened to my ExxonMobil? Where is it? And then you'll go into your cash account and go, where did all this money come from? So, we know when expiration Friday is, the third Friday of the month. We know when the contracts expire, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. All we have to do is buy back the option before 4 o'clock. That's all we have to do, and our shares will not be sold. Then we still own the shares, and we sell the next month's option. That's called rolling the option. Now, if we roll out to the next month to the same strike price, sell the April 50, buy back the April 50, sell the May 50. That's called rolling out. Buy back the April 50, sell the May 52. That's called rolling out and up. And by the way, there's a tab on the Elman calculator. We'll do these numbers for you as well. So that's how you avoid having your share sold if the strike price is in the money as expiration Friday, uh, 4 p.m. is approaching. Very easy. We know the time, we know the day, and we just buy back the option. Now, generally, I have found early exercise to be rare. Um, here are some reasons why. The call buyer can control those shares up to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, the third Friday of the month. The call buyer has control of those shares. Uh, and they can keep the cash that they would use to buy those shares in an interest-bearing account up to the last minute. Why not do that? Also, the call buyer is exposing themselves to greater risk if they do exercise early because the price of the stock is so much greater than the price of the option. So that's another reason why early exercise can be so rare. And finally, and this is very, very important, if a call buyer exercises the option and then sells the shares, they will have captured intrinsic value, but they will have lost time value. Remember I told you, the option premium consists of intrinsic value plus time value when the strike is in the money. Let's make up some numbers here. Let's say the price of the stock is 52. We sold the 50 call and it's mid-contract. 
It's not expiration Friday. Well, what's the price of that option going to be worth? Well, we know it's got $2 of intrinsic value and then some time value component. Let's say a dollar. That's $3. Well, the option holder can exercise the option, buy shares from us at 50, turn around, sell it at market at 52, thereby generating $2. But they can also just sell the option for $3. So it wouldn't really make sense. So um, that's, th that's another reason why early exercise is, it can be so rare. Now, when early exercise does occur, okay, and this is important because we're going to do several slides on this, it's normally resulting from a dividend distribution that's going to take place uh, prior to contract expiration. And it's not actually the, ex the, the distribution date that we have to focus in on. It's the ex-dividend date, which occurs prior to the distribution date. So, um, and that's the date that you must own the shares in order to be eligible to capture the dividend. So, here's where it's most likely to get early exercise. When the ex-dividend date is close to expiration Friday, number one. Number two, when the, when the call strike price is in the money, lower than the stock price. And finally, when the dividend that will be distributed sometime after the X date is greater than the time value component of the option. So when those things take place, then it's more likely, but not even guaranteed, that early exercise will take place. But if we're lo looking to circumnavigate around X dividend dates and make sure that we have mitigated the possibility of early exercise to the greatest extent possible, then we're going to need to focus in on, on these particular bullets that we have on this slide here. Now, before we move on to the next slide, let me tell you why I said it's never 100% guaranteed. Let's say that uh, by selling the option, we can generate $3. Uh, by exercising, we can generate $2. Well, we, we know that then it doesn't make sense to actually exercise early for that reason, but what if there's a dividend involved also? And what if the dividend is 50 cents? And what if the time value on the option is a dollar? Well, you would say to yourself, well, they're not going to exercise early. But many retail investors do not understand the relationship between dividend distribution and the time value component of the option. And they will send an exercise notice to their broker, who will then randomly send it over to the options clearing corporation, who randomly then sends it over to one of its brokers, could be ours. And then our broker randomly sends it over to one of its clients, could be us. So that's why I say it's very rare when uh, we'll get early exercise when it makes no sense, but it can happen. In about 25 years of covered call writing, it's happened to me maybe five times. So how do we avoid early exercise as it relates to an ex-dividend date? Well, number one, you have to know when the ex-date is. And uh, you can get that from several free sites like DividendInvestor.com where you just put in the ticker symbol of the stock and you will get the information. Uh, what you do then is you sell the option the day after the X date, uh, specifically if it's early in the contract. Now, you could technically sell the option the day of the X date. I like to wait another day just to make sure there are no administrative uh, snafus. Uh, so I just wait for the day after the X date. But again, technically, you can sell at the X date. Now, if the X date is late in the contract and you can't wait till after the X date because you're not going to generate any premium, then uh, the previous month, rather than write a one-month option, write a two-month option, and that will move the contract expiration date far away from the X dividend date. Now, here's that dividend invest, uh, investor site over here. And uh, you could see for American Express, highlighted in that pink row over there, that the X date was January 8th. So either we sell the option on January 9th, or when the December contracts expire, instead of selling a January contract, sell a February contract. So here are the guidelines before we get into some real-life examples. Uh, here are the guidelines for early exercise. If the X date is in the first week of a contract, sell the option the next day. Pretty simple. And, and, and then the dividend distribution will have nothing at all to do with early exercise. If the X date is later in the contract, sell a two-month option after expiration of the previous contract, 
moving the contract expiration date far away from the ex-dividend date. Here are the assumptions that we're making here. We have a long-term buy and hold portfolio. Shares are at a low cost basis. Uh, in a non-sheltered account, we don't want our shares sold. We want to leverage these shares, though, to generate additional income. Again, we want our cake and eat it, too. We roll the option if the strike is in the money by expiration. Remember, we could roll out to the same strike or roll out and up to a higher strike. Sell options the day after an X date if the X date is in the first week of a contract or use a two-month option if it's later in the contract. And once again, our goal in this hypothetical, and that number can be tweaked, is 6% a year or a half a percent a month. Here's another screenshot for Home Depot. The X date is 12-3 sell the option on 12.4. This is not rocket science, folks. Now let's have a look at this options chain for Home Depot. We're going to look at a one-month options chain. The price of the security was 80.44 when I made this uh, screenshot. So how would we know which strike to use? How do we figure it out? Well, we kind of work backwards. We know that our goal is a half a percent a month. Well, 1% of 80.44 is 80 cents. So a half a percent is 40 cents. So we go down the strikes, remember only out of the money, so strikes higher than 80.44, we roll down and then we look in the bid column to see is there any published bid price about 40 cents. And yes, the 83 strike has a published bid of 41 cents, which meets our target of a half a percent a month. So the 41 cents does represent the 0.51%, plus we have an opportunity for continued share appreciation because we use the out-of-the-money strike. Remember, for portfolio overriding, we only use out-of-the-money strikes. So that gives us an opportunity for an additional 3.1% from the share appreciation side. So this particular month, by portfolio overriding, we have the possibility of a 3.6% one-month return from option premium and share appreciation. But again, if the share stayed stagnant, we now will still have generated that half a percent. Now, what if there was an X date and we wanted to look at the two-month options chain? In this particular case, when I made this screenshot, it was actually seven weeks, but approximately two months. Now, if we're going two months, now we can't use a half a percent anymore because there are six two-month periods in a calendar year, so we're going to shoot for 1%. Now, 1% 1 of 8066 is 80 cents. So once again, we go to the out-of-the-money strikes on the far right, and we look in the published bid column for 80 cents. And we see that the 8250 strike generates a six, which is kind of much higher than we need, and the 85 strike generates 44 cents, which is lower than what we really need. So how do we do this? Well, if we're selling more than one contract, do half of each, because that would average out to close to our 80 cent target. It would average out actually to 75 cents. So we use 1% to annualize out to 6% if we're doing a two month option. And our target goal, we do half of each. You know, most of us own shares in more than 100 share increments, but if you only have 100 shares and you want to use it, I would actually target the lower goal of 44 cents giving you more opportunity for share appreciation and less possibility of needing to roll the option. So it's never going to work out precisely or it's rarely going to work out precisely, but you can actually manipulate the numbers to come out pretty close to what your target goal is. Let's summarize. Portfolio overriding uh, can be a way of enhancing portfolio value by leveraging your long-term buy and hold stocks and we can also minimize, dramatically minimize, the possibility of early exercise. And that really are the two goals of this strategy, generating additional income and mitigating the possibility of our shares being sold as a result of our option obligation. Dividend distribution is the main reason for early exercise. And once again, it's not the distribution date that we must focus in on, it's the ex-dividend date which takes place prior to the distribution date. So uh, what we're going to do then is either sell the option in those cases the day after the X date or use a two-month option if it's late in the contract. And once again, let me reiterate that covered call writing 
limits share appreciation up to the strike price. And that is the reason why we focused in only on out-of-the-money strikes as it relates to portfolio overriding. Okay, so I'm going to turn this back to Mark, but let me just say that uh, if you have any questions, you can reach me at alan at the bluecollarinvestor.com specific to the BCI methodology. Otherwise, you could refer to the OIC for general options questions. Uh, Barry also uh, can be reached at barry at the bluecollarinvestor.com. You could see that on the screenshot there. And for those of you who want free copies of the Elman Calculator and a lot more free resources, Go to the website uh, you see at the bottom of the screenshot there, the bluecollarinvestor.com, and look at the top black bar of those web pages. Click on the free resources link, uh, put in your email address, and then you could download all the calculators and all the other files that will be a huge help to you in elevating the returns you get from this great strategy of covered call writing. Uh, thank you again for attending. I thank you, Mark, and the OIC for inviting me to speak here. And uh, how are we doing here, Mark? Uh, Alan, we're doing great. We still have uh, we still got some time, and uh, luckily we've got uh, a load of questions in the hopper here. Uh, here's a, a question that we have: Would you recommend closing your position early if your annualized goal is met? For example, if you're looking to make a quarter percent, uh, you know, over 15 days or you know whatever that goal is, if, if you're meeting that goal, should you just uh, you know close out of the position, take your chips off the table, live to play another day, or should you roll the dice? No, I would uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it rolling the dice by leaving the position in play. I would always have very specific guidelines as to when to close the position. Uh, for example, uh, part of the BCI methodology is uh, is a guideline known as the 20% 10% guideline, and it dictates when to buy back an option if share price is declining. And um, just just to give you a quick example how that works is if we sold an option for two dollars. And the, and the option value declines to $0.40 cents or less, that's 20% of $2, then we automatically buy back the option. But that doesn't mean you're going to close the, the long stock position. You may roll down or you may wait for the price of the stock to bounce back up. And actually, frequently, you can actually sell that very same option in the same month on the same stock. I call that hitting a double. So um, you have to have very specific guidelines. Now, your question referenced the price of the stock going up. So if you've already passed your strike price, and it depends on the time value component left in that premium. Uh, give you an example. We bought a stock. Well, let's go back to our preview example, Mark. We bought a stock at 48. We sold the 50 call. We generated $1.50, and then we got another $2 on share appreciation at that point in time. Let's say some news came out about that particular stock. Let's say an FDA approval of a drug, and boom, the stock pops to 60. Well, now, what's the premium going to be? The premium is going to be at least $10 of intrinsic value from 60 to 50 plus some time value component. But when a strike price goes deep, deep, deep in the money, one of the characteristics of that option is that the time value component approaches zero. So it may cost us $10.05 to buy back that option. Now, on the surface, that may seem extremely expensive when you compare it to the dollar fifty that you generated when you sold the initial option, but it, in reality, it's not. And the reason I say that is because when we sell a fifty call, that means that our shares could never be worth more than fifty dollars as long as we have that option obligation. So if we buy back that option for ten dollars and five cents, we now have freed up that stock to be worth current market value or sixty. So on the option side we have a minus 1005. On the stock side, we have a plus 10. Net, net, it costs us $5 a contract to close. That's when I would close a contract when share price has accelerated dramatically. When the time value component of that premium approaches zero, we could sell the stock, use that cash to enter a new covered call position, and as long as that new position can generate more cash then it cost us to close $5 in this hypothetical, then I'm in. But other than that, no, I stay in the game and I don't spend the money that it's going to cost to close that position. Uh, I stay with it and, and ride it out so I can maximize my returns. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Now, uh, Alan, here's a question that in Investor Services we receive 
several times a day and certainly through a lot of these presentations. Uh, it's a very, very popular question. What are your techniques, uh, you know, when it comes to a covered call strategy, a lot of people certainly are interested in what strike do we select, and we've talked about that, you know, in the money versus out of the money strikes. But but when it comes to the stock, what what do you look for in a stock to determine, all right, I want to write a, uh, I want to write a call on XYZ versus I want to write a call on ZYX. How, how do you determine which stock to select? Very, very important. Uh, that was one of the three required skills that I alluded to during the presentation. Uh, I have a three-pronged approach to selecting uh, stocks for cover call, specifically for covered call writing. Now, before I give you those three, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't select the underlying security based on the premium return. Too many people do that. They, they say, wow, this particular stock generates 8% in a month. Well, what that means is it's a very volatile underlying security, and you're enhancing the risk to the downside. So never do that. Here's what you should do. Uh, well, here's what I do, I should say. There's a lot of ways of doing this. What I do first is I screen fundamentally. So I'm looking for earnings and sales growth. I use uh, various IBD screens and a couple of others. It's all in my material. And the reason I like to screen from a fundamental perspective first is because stocks that are increasing in sales and revenues are specifically the stocks that institutional investors love. I'm talking about mutual funds, hedge funds, banks, insurance companies. They love these stocks. And if those guys love those stocks, then I love them too. So we first screen from a fundamental perspective. Then we use a technical analysis. So we, we, we look at a chart pattern, the price chart pattern. Now, there are so many different parameters, and there's no right or wrong. I'm just going to list for you the four parameters that I use. Uh, those of you that know technical analysis, it'll make sense. Those of you who don't, it'll sound intimidating. But if you could tell if a line is going up or down or if it's above or below zero, you could read a price chart. I use two exponential moving averages to identify trend, the 100-day and the 20-day. I use the MACD histogram, and I use the stochastic oscillator to, to look at momentum, and then I confirm with volume. So those are the four technical parameters. So that's the second screening prong. The third one is what I call common sense principles. And uh, they're also all in my material, but I'll just tell you the most important one <clears throat> is to avoid earnings reports. So never, never, never sell an option if there's an upcoming earnings report. Way too risky. But other things like minimum trading volume, I, I only look at shares trading 250,000 shares per day or more on average. Um, diversification, asset allocation, or a couple more. So those are the three prongs, what to look for in a stock. And once again, what not to look for is how much premium you can get. So once you have your watch list of quality, elite, underlying securities, then you can go to the options chain and see which ones meet your target goal. And my target goal for my monthly initial returns are 2 to 4% a month for my initial returns in my accounts and 1 to 2% a month uh, in my mom's account. And you could tweak that based on your own personal risk tolerance, uh, higher or lower. Well, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And what I do doesn't mean what everybody else should do, but I'm happy to share with you how I do it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, here's a question uh, about Delta. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, you're not using Delta, and, and the, uh, the attendee is wondering, well, why not use both Delta and the half percent rule uh, as a confirmation? Uh, you're, you're, kind, you're kind of using Delta in that uh, we know that low Delta stocks, ba low, Delta, low Delta options basically are out-of-the-money options. So, uh, you know, you're not going to use a point uh, eight Delta and still have an out-of-the-money strike. So in, in essence, you are using delta based on the moneyness of the strike that you're selecting. But uh, if, you, if you have a, a delta that's not going to give you what your target return is, what's the point of zeroing in on the delta when you, you, you want to meet your target goal first? So um, I think in, in essence, peripherally, you are using delta, but I think it's more important to make sure that you're achieving your target goal for the strategy that you're using. Okay. Um, last question. Uh, how about, and I apologize if I, uh, if I had missed this during your presentation, did you talk about the uh, tax treatment of this uh, strategy? Well, I alluded to it a little bit in portfolio overriding that there are tax consequences, um, you know, if you're trading in a non 
uh, sheltered account if your shares are sold. But re relating to the uh, option end of things, and I, I don't like to talk tax because I'm not a tax expert, but I right. do know for a fact that, uh, you know, options are short-term capital gains. And uh, the only uh, exception that I know of, and I, and I would advise everybody to check with your, your tax expert on this, but if you, uh, if you sell an option on, on an underlying security that you've owned for more than a year and a day, and it's exercised and your shares are sold, then uh, the option premium is incorporated into the sale of the stock, and it becomes long-term capital gains. But generally speaking, covered call writing, traditionally the way I do it, as opposed to portfolio overriding, which is what we talked about today, uh, basically is short-term capital gains. But as I said in the presentation, covered call writing is the one strategy that across the board, every single broker will allow to be used in self-directed IRA accounts. So if you have the opportunity to use this strategy in a sheltered account, you should do so. And this way you don't have Uncle Sam in as your partner. Right. I, I, that, that makes sense. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I would also just add on to Alan's comment there, uh, recently back in February, we had a two-day tax uh, webinar featuring uh, Robert Gordon from 21st Century Securities, where uh, one of those sessions exclusively was the tax treatment of covered call writing. So if you missed that presentation or if, uh, if you'd like uh, some information about it again, go ahead and get in touch with our investor services group. Uh, the email address is options at the OCC.com, and we can go ahead and get you that information, uh, a link to the replay of that event. Uh, and speaking of investor services and speaking of uh, time, it looks like we're just about out of it today. So, Alan, I certainly want to thank you for your time and expertise, and Barry, you as well, for responding to the questions of our audience. I know that it was greatly appreciated. Uh, for the, the rest of our attendees, while we weren't able to get to all of your questions, we do have our investor services group uh, ready to help. So again, feel free to reach out to them at options at the OCC.com. Uh, we also will be forwarding questions specific to this event uh, to Barry and Alan. Uh, hopefully they'll uh, be able to answer those for us in their free time uh, over the next uh, day or two, and we can get back to you that way. Uh, in the meantime, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at options underscore edu and like us on Facebook. You can also view our previous webinars on our our OIC Options Education, uh, org page or our YouTube channel. And of course, make sure to visit our website uh, for information of our next online or live in-person session. So please be sure to check out our optionseducation.org website for more details. And again, ladies and gentlemen, Alan, Barry, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for attending, and we hope to see you next time.